I'll be reading Acts 2, 37 through 42. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Good morning. We continue our series this morning on the Holy Spirit and the elders and preachers met yesterday and and, uh, did some some further study and discussion on on things regarding the the Holy Spirit. We began that discussion last fall and led into this series and and then we we met yesterday and continued the study of, of this topic and um, kind of further develop those thoughts and, and got the ball rolling on some things that we want to do uh, through the rest of this year in regards to our, our kind of our theme of studying the Holy Spirit for the year. And, and it was a, a good day of study for us. I appreciate so much the men that, uh, that serve in the roles that, that they do in this congregation. I, I, I appreciate their, their commitment to following Scripture. I appreciate their commitment to the truth and, and uh, to being... Um, to being men that humbly follow the things that, that we learn in the, the scriptures. And so, as we talked yesterday, one of the things that was sort of acknowledged was that we haven't done enough teaching on the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that's not unique to our congregation here. I think that's probably a, a, a situation that exists throughout many congregations uh, of the churches of Christ throughout our country, and, and one reason that we talked about is because there's so much error and so much controversy out there being taught that we want to stay away from the error and the controversy, and so we kind of ignore the topic altogether, and that's not right. We shouldn't do that, so, um, so we, we want to make sure that we are teaching the truth, uh, even amidst those that would be teaching things that uh, we think go beyond what the Bible teaches. Um, another reason is that it's sometimes difficult. The things that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit sometimes are hard to understand and sometimes hard for us to, to make application of. And so we tend to, to shy away from things that are difficult. And we don't need to do that as well. We need to make sure that we are teaching things, um, whether they're easy to understand or whether they're hard to understand. And so we want to commit ourselves to making sure that we are uh, teaching the whole counsel of God and and teaching everything that the Bible teaches. So we are, um, we are really looking at ways that we can make the teaching about the Holy Spirit that, that is in the Bible uh, plain and have to a better understanding of it. Um, and so as I did some reflecting on those things yesterday, one thing that became clear was that as I look back over the, the last couple of series that we've done, if we look back at the topic of love last year, um, I should have preached more about the Holy Spirit. There should have been more lessons about the Holy Spirit and His connection to love. And, and I thought about two years ago when we talked about the kingdom, and I should have done a lot more teaching about the Holy Spirit and preaching about the Holy Spirit when it came to, to preaching about what the kingdom is uh, and what Christ was promising when He brought the kingdom. So, um, so being that the Holy Spirit is our theme for this year, uh, expect more, to, of course, to hear more about that in the coming year. But hopefully, hopefully it will become part of our understanding of all things uh, in the Scripture because we cannot detach the Holy Spirit from Scripture. Uh, the Scripture is the work of the Holy Spirit. We, we saw that last week when we looked at one of the things that the Holy Spirit has as His purview, as His area of work, is revelation. And so as we learn anything that the, Spirit, that the, the Scriptures have to teach us, we need to include our understanding of the Holy Spirit 
in that topic. So uh, expect us to be a, a congregation from here on out. I would, uh, I would hope that I can say with, uh, with truth that from now on we will be a congregation uh, that learns what the Spirit uh, has to say or has to do with whatever topic we are engaging ourselves in uh, studying. So that's just kind of a, uh, uh, a little statement about our meeting yesterday and kind of where we go from here. So we'll, we'll see some more things come out of that meeting and, and we are going to meet further uh, as well over, uh, over this issue. So we, uh, we will be doing some planning and, and revealing those plans as we move forward. Uh, in, the, in the short term, it will affect kind of the direction that these lessons take. Uh, but in the long term, it will affect some of the Bible classes and, and some of, the, um, uh, some of the, the future series or topics that we'll undertake through the course of the year as well. Uh, so with that, with that part of the introduction uh, completed, uh, let's move on to uh, just kind of looking real briefly at where we've been so far, or at least partially where we've been so far in our study of the Holy Spirit Last week, we looked at the idea of being born of the Spirit, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, rather, we looked at being born of the Spirit, what Jesus said in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that unless one is born of the Spirit, uh, of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So being born of the Spirit is a condition for entering the kingdom. If we, uh, if we want to be a kingdom people, if we want to be a part of the Lord's kingdom, then we we need to have an understanding of what it means to be born of the Spirit because Jesus associated those two things. And if we know nothing or, or understand nothing about the Spirit or being born of the Spirit, then uh, what hope do we have of being a part of the kingdom that Jesus came to establish? And we saw through what Jesus told Nicodemus that a spiritual kingdom, which is the kingdom that Christ promised, it was not a physical kingdom. If it was a physical kingdom, he told Pilate uh, on the day of his crucifixion, if, it, if my kingdom were a an earthly kingdom, my followers would be fighting right now to free me, but it is not a physical kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom, and a spiritual kingdom requires a spiritual birth, and so we need to understand what it means to be born of the Spirit. And then we saw that connection in John chapter 3 that Jesus made between being born of the water and born of the Spirit. He associated those two things, and so we cannot detach the idea of being born of the Spirit from being born of the water which we associate with baptism. And so uh, those two things are related. We saw also in our lesson last week the work of the Spirit, that uh, there are some aspects of the, the work of the Spirit that are ongoing and continuous. And we talk specifically in that context about things like regeneration and sanctification, uh, which are works of the Spirit. But then there are some parts of the work uh, of the Spirit that are complete. Uh, we talked about creation. Uh, creation was a, a six-day creative process, and at the end of that creation, God rested, and creation stopped. And so the Spirit's association with that work uh, was complete, and there's no f further creation taking place. And so our job then, our role, is to look at those things that the Spirit is involved in and see which of those things are ongoing that we need to be participating in, that we need to be uh, kindling, that we need to be... Um, employing that we need to be uh, engaging in versus those things that the Spirit has already completed and we just simply need to know about and to study uh, and to make sure that we are versed in those things. So, uh, so we'll, we'll look at, at some of those topics in greater detail as we move forward in our study of the Spirit, but that just sort of introduced that topic last week. And so then today we build on that or we, we kind of uh, turn our focus, if you will, from being born of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit. Now we want to look at this idea of the gift of the Spirit that came from our reading today. And, and so we want to lay a little groundwork because the context, the setting of the story is important for the things that Peter says in the passage that we have at hand today in Acts chapter 2. And so uh, just quickly looking back as, as we have in our Sunday morning Bible classes have been studying the book of Acts, so it's, it should should be at least somewhat fresh in, in most of our minds as we've been participating in that study. Uh, if you look back in Acts chapter 1 at the beginning, and, and we'll look at some of this in more detail as we move through the lesson, but uh, early in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his disciples it's, it's the day of his ascension. He is, has been raised from the dead, and he is 
ready to go back to, to heaven to be with the Father, to, to receive the reward that the Father has promised him, to be seated upon the throne. And Jesus, in his final address, his final statement to his apostles, tells them to wait for him and uh, to wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from on high. And then uh, we'll, we'll kind of break that down a little more as, as we move forward because it, it informs one of the points that we want to make today. But the, the apostles do then wait in Jerusalem. They obey Jesus' direction to wait in Jerusalem. And during that week of waiting, they select a replacement for Judas, of course, who was the one who betrayed Jesus and had committed suicide and died. And so um, they need to bring the number of the apostles back to 12. And so they, uh, they select a replacement for Judas. And then in Acts chapter 2, we have the 12. They're gathered in Jerusalem waiting. It says uh, they were all together in one place. Uh, some speculate that it may be the same room where they ate the Last Supper together, that that upper room uh, where we see John chapters 13 through uh, 16 taking place. And there, uh, perhaps it was there, perhaps it was somewhere else nearby. Uh, but while they're in that room, that outpouring of power takes place. That outpouring of the Spirit happens. It says that they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in other tongues in verse 4 uh, of Acts chapter 2 uh, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And so they kind of spill out then into the this is taking place in a in private in a room where they were gathered together but then very quickly we find them out uh sort of in the temple complex where they are surrounded by people it's a feast day it's the day of pentecost and so there are large crowds of people from all over the the world really all over the known world at that time gathered in jerusalem for the feast of pentecost and we find the apostles then taking uh taking it out on the road, if you will. They go out from the place where they had been gathered in private, uh, where the outpouring of the Spirit happened, and then they find themselves surrounded by people. And as they are surrounded by people, they begin speaking in other tongues, and all were amazed. Uh, most were confused, and some are, are, are mocking them. Some are you know, just, just not convinced that what we're seeing is legitimate here. And so they begin mocking the, uh, mocking the apostles and saying things like, perhaps they're drunk. Uh, but it was still early in the morning, and that wouldn't be the case. Uh, and then Peter takes a stand, and he delivers the very first gospel sermon of the Christian age. And so, so we recognize this as the first gospel sermon, that the Spirit has been poured out upon the apostles as Christ has promised he would be. And the apostles begin preaching, and, and Peter is sort of the main one that is preaching, but others have already been speaking in tongues and, and telling people uh, about Jesus. And without reading the whole text of that sermon, although it is a good sermon, if you haven't read it, you should read it. Uh, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, Peter begins preaching. And he finishes that sermon, and that sort of that conclusion or the end of that sermon is where we had our scripture reading today. And so the conclusion of that sermon is that it affected the people who heard it. They were convinced of what Peter had said, and they asked their question. And Peter answers that question um, with the phrase that gives us the title for our lesson today, the idea of them receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we want to, to sort of break that down in today, and, and really uh, I anticipate that we'll... Uh, We'll delve deeper into this topic as we move through our study of the Spirit uh, in future weeks. And really what today is serves as sort of a, an introduction to the idea of what is this gift of the Spirit. Um, and so let's talk about what, uh, and I reversed it on the notes. I did what it is first and what it isn't in the fir uh, next in the notes, but I'm going to switch that uh, for our lesson today, and we're going to do point B first. Uh, so point B is what it isn't or what it can't really be, uh, because we don't want to cloud the issue by, by thinking about things that don't really pertain to what Peter is talking about here. Peter uh, is talking about something specific, and if we have too broad of a view or too broad of an understanding of what it is that it could be, then we, then we detract from what it actually is. And so what it can't be, first of all, would be the baptism of the Spirit. That's not what Peter is telling the people that they will receive with their baptism. Now, it, it seems odd for people to, uh, Peter to say, repent 
And let each, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift is not the baptism of the Spirit. And it's important for us to understand that, that while it is associated with baptism, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but uh, while it is associated with water baptism, it is not the baptism of the Spirit. So for us to understand that, I think we need to look back at Acts chapter 1. Look back uh, in Acts, Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 3. Uh, actually, look back into, at verse, well, let's just start at verse 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And so when Jesus instructed his apostles to do something, whose message was Jesus delivering? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was speaking through Jesus, telling him, tell your apostles that Here's where they're supposed to wait for me. I'm, gonna sh I'm, I'm on the way. I'm coming. I'm going to be there. You tell them to wait for me. And so that was the Holy Spirit's message. And so verse 3, to these he also presented himself alive. That is, to the, to the apostles, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking to the, of the things concerning the kingdom of God, and gathering them, the apostles together, he commanded them, the apostles, not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, so who is it that Jesus is promising the baptism of the Holy Spirit to? Well, he's promising that to the apostles. The apostles are the ones that have received that promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So... Uh, so they ask their question, then verse 7, Jesus continues on, is not for you to know the time or the epics uh, by which the Father has fixed his own authority. And then he says, but you, that is the twelve, the apostles, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. The promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus makes at the beginning of Acts chapter 12 was made or Acts chapter 1, was made specifically to the 12. And so when Peter, who has just received that, I mean, just moments ago, Peter was in that room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and the tongues of fire and the sound of the wind and the, the baptism of the Spirit takes place, and the outpouring of that power happens upon the 12, Peter then comes out and he preaches this sermon and he promises the gift of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the same thing that just happened to Peter. He doesn't promise the baptism of the Spirit, he promises the gift of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit was promised to the apostles, and it's important for us to understand that. Another thing that it cannot be uh, here that Peter is talking about, and this one is, if, if it wasn't you know, kind of kind of strange enough that Peter mentions baptism, but it's not the baptism of the Spirit. So we have those two things that we have to delineate against. So what is the gift of the Spirit? Well, it's not the gifts of the Spirit, okay? The gift of the Spirit is a specific thing that Peter is talking about, and it's not the gifts of the Spirit that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and following. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1... Paul writing there says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. So Paul is writing it to inform them about spiritual gifts, about the gifts of the Spirit. And he goes on to delineate what those are. If you look at verses 7 through 11, he says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, a gift of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. And so while we will down the road, talk about the gifts of the Spirit. That's not the same thing as the gift of the Spirit. That sounds confusing. Uh, 
but we have to we have to make sure that we're keeping those things uh, separated from one another appropriately as the Bible separates them from one another. It's not that we are making arbitrary distinctions because we're we're becoming grammar Nazis or something like that. It's that we are looking specifically at what the Bible teaches in in uh, in each instance where it talks about the Spirit, and we'd want to make sure that we understand those things clearly. So the gift of the Spirit that Peter is talking about is not the baptism of the Spirit. It's not the miraculous manifestation of gifts of the Spirit. It is something else that is different from those things. So then what is it? Well, the first thing that we need to notice is that it's the fulfillment of a promise. And I put verse 33 there. I meant verse 39. Um, verse 39, Peter, as he is is talking to the people in response to the question that they've asked he says for the promise is for you and your children what had he just told them he the thing that he said right before that he said and you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit for the promise the promise of what well the the promise of the, that god has made through the centuries is for you and for your children and so what is that promise? Well, we need to understand that promise. The promise goes all the way back to Abraham. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, part of the promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 22 is he says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Well, go back to Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 6. Uh, or verse 7, when they were amazed and marveled, why are these, uh, are, are, all, are not all these who are speaking Galileans, how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? How many nations were gathered together on the day of Pentecost hearing the first gospel sermon preached, seeing the outpouring of the Spirit upon the, uh, the apostles and seeing the effects of that and hearing the gospel preached for the first time? And then it lists a bunch of those nations. And so here, Peter is saying this promise has been made to you uh, and to your children. It was made all the way back in Genesis to Abraham when God told Abraham that through your seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. And so this is the fulfillment of that promise. Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 says, In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of of the spirit through faith the the gift of the spirit is the fulfillment of god's promise to abraham that's important that's a major milestone in in biblical history that's not something small that we just need to to say oh that's cool and move on that's a a major doctrinal understanding that we need to come to grips with is that when peter preached the first gospel sermon and he promised that those who heard that sermon and responded to it would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that it was an outpouring of God's promise that he had made to Abraham over a thousand years before that. That is a big thing. And so, so the gift of the Holy Spirit is God keeping his promise that he would bless all nations of the earth. We need to see also that the gift of the Holy Spirit is related to to the condition of the heart. It's got something to do with the hearts of those who receive that gift. And, and we see that playing out in this passage through the way that Peter has preached his sermon and the effect that it has on those who heard that sermon. In verse 37 it says, when they heard this, when they heard that they were the ones who, who had crucified and put to death the Lord, who, who God has made him both Lord and Christ, whom you have crucified, when they heard that, what happened? They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what do we do? You've told us what we've done. We put to death Christ. We put to death the Messiah. We, we consented to his death. We have, we have put to death the Son of God. Now what do we do? We know what we've done, but what we do, that's a condition of the heart. That's a, a heartfelt question that they are asking. Look at Jeremiah 31. 
Jeremiah 31, God is writing about the new covenant that he is going to make. He says, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. It's a matter of the heart. I will write my covenant upon their heart. And where is it that the Spirit resides when we receive the gift of the Spirit? Jesus said that to enter into a spiritual kingdom required a spiritual birth. We see that being born of the Spirit is a spiritual activity. It's a spiritual moment. We see that the work of the Spirit is involved in regeneration and sanctification of God's people. We see that it is a condition of the heart that Peter says must take place before we can receive the gift of the Spirit. All of these things fit together to show us that God has been promising this from the beginning, and He is delivering it through His Spirit. We see, next of all, tied right into that idea that it's a condition of the heart, we see that it is a that it is connected to salvation. Jeremiah, as he wrote about the covenant, said that, that their sin I will remember against them no more. That's a statement of salvation. I will save them from their sins. It's a condition of the heart. I will make them my people. And Peter makes that connection as well here when he says, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is a connection between that moment of the reception of God's grace, the moment of the reception of forgiveness for sins, and the receipt of the Holy Spirit as God's gift to that one who has been saved. The gift of the Holy Spirit is connected to salvation. We've seen already the in, in our previous lessons, the idea that the, the Spirit is at work in salvation. We see the Spirit at work in regeneration in Titus 3, verse 5. says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit are are two things that are connected and are inseparable. You cannot take them away from one another because God has put them together. God has connected them, and we can't separate them. So there is a washing that takes place, and the gift of the Spirit, the renewing by the Spirit, takes place in that same act. We see also 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul has just list, given a sort of a laundry list of, of things that are fleshly, things that are works of, of destruction, that are, are works that stand opposed to God. And in verse 11, he says, Such were some of you. You were involved in some of those things that I just mentioned. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. The gift of the Spirit is connected to salvation. We can't remove it from salvation. It can't take place outside of the context of salvation. It can't happen without salvation. And yet without it, salvation hasn't taken place. They are connected in that act of being saved. And so then the question becomes, well, who is it that receives this gift? I mean, if it's connected to the heart, if it's connected to salvation, then, then how do we know if it's not something visible and and audible and 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 big and, and audacious like the the apostles received at the baptism of the holy spirit then how do we know whether or not we have participated or received that gift of the spirit we'll look at look at chapter acts chapter 2 verses 40 and 41 says there, and with many other words he that is peter solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying be saved from this perverse generation. 
So then those who had received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Well, two things stand out. Peter continuously tells them to be saved. What happens at that moment of salvation? That gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's connected. They're, they're inseparable. We can't take those two things away from one another. And Peter was saying, be saved from this perverted generation. And, and I know probably what you're thinking at hearing that. Well, he, Peter should have seen what's happening in our day and age, right? But he was part of a generation that had rejected Christ. That's what he means by that. This perverted generation that put to death the Son of God, that, that delivered Christ over to the Gentiles to be crucified, that, that, that were standing on the hillside screaming, crucify him, crucify him. That's perversion. To have the Son of God stand before you in, in purity and in innocence and in sinlessness and for you, you to shout, crucify him, crucify him, that's perversion. And there are still there those gathered in that crowd that day that had consented to Christ's death who still were defending what they had done, who still were saying he wasn't the Son of God, who were still saying that he was of the devil. And Peter is standing before them saying, by the power of the Spirit that you have seen us working today, we have demonstrated to you that he was the Son of God and you need to be saved from this perverted generation. And in that salvation, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when they heard, they believed, and they accepted, and they received his word, and they were baptized. There was a washing that took place. There was a forgiveness that took place in that moment of washing, and that gift was received at the moment of salvation. Who receives the gift? Those who are saved. Who are the saved? Those who obey and are baptized. That's who receives the gift of the Spirit. And so our question today then is, what value do you place on this gift? Do you, do you ever do that with a gift that you receive? You, you look at it and it's beautiful and you think, huh, I wonder how much this cost. Maybe I'm the only one. How do you put a value on a gift? It's the thought that counts, right? I mean, we say that all the time. It's the thought that counts. And, and we don't really want to be the kind of people who associate a price tag or a, uh, you know, a dollar amount to a, a gift that we've received. We don't want to be that person. How do you value the gift that God offers? God is offering the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we have preconceived notions about how to receive that gift or about what we need to do to receive that gift or, or not do to receive that gift. And we want to tell God, I, I, it's not that valuable to me. It's not worth it. I'm not going to change what I believe. I'm not going to change what I think. I'm not going to give up what I'm clinging to, whether it's sin, whether it's false doctrine, whether it's a misunderstanding of, of the truth. I'm not going to give those things up because those are more valuable to me, God, than what you're offering me. How do we value the gift that God is offering us? We place the highest value on it possible when we accept it and when we accept it on his terms. That's how we value it. And so this morning, the gift is there. It's, it's offered. It's It's waiting. And all you have to do is accept it. If you have any need, I pray that you would come forward and make that need known to us while we stand and sing.